and welcome everyone to this first session of the conference. Uh, my name is Nikolai Boyajev. I'm the co-director of the Postgraduate Education Program and the Experimental Design Research Think Tank at the Strzok Institute for Media Architecture and Design in Moscow. And I'm very happy and honored to, to be joined by Indy Johar and uh, Primavera de Filippi for this first panel on uh, new urban governance uh, experimenting with technology. Uh, so the relationship between city, the city and technologies of governance is I think a really fascinating topic to, to kick off the conference and obviously is one that has acquired a newfound uh, relevance and urgency, uh, both in theory and in practice in the past uh, 20 months. So today's speakers will present uh, work and ideas to address this urgency, um, asking more specifically, um, how can different technologies, uh, you know, help us uh, adapt existing urban management models? What different types of agency uh, are available within these governance processes? And uh, most importantly, uh, why? Why do cities need to experiment with new technologies? Uh, what is the value of this process for cities uh, that are facing uh, contemporary challenges? Uh, each, each speaker will present for about uh, 20 minutes, uh, followed by a short Q&A. And I invite you to send your questions to the broadcasting chat uh, so that we can pass them along. Uh, and uh, without further ado, let me please introduce uh, the, our first speaker, Indy uh, Johar. So Indy is an architect and uh, the founder of Dark Matter Labs, as well as the co-founder of Project Zero Zero. Uh, he has co-led uh, multiple projects, experiments, uh, studies, and social ventures, uh, working with large uh, global multinationals and institutions uh, to support their transition uh, to a more positive uh, systems economy. He's also an independent director of the Winehouse Foundation, an RIBA trustee, and an advisor to the mayor of London on good growth. And uh, for us at Strzok Institute, uh, his ongoing uh, work with Dark Meadows Labs has been a huge inspiration. So thank you so much for joining us, Indy, and, and welcome. Uh, honestly, I'm really honored to be here. I, much like yourself, I, I, I've been a deep admirer of Strzoka and what you guys have been doing, because I think it's the integrity of how you guys are looking at architecture, but also information and governance in really smart ways, I think is really refreshing. And it's also not, uh, it's divergent, which I think is really critical. So Nikolai, real pleasure to be here. Um, so I, I suppose from my side, um, I would love to, one of the reasons I'm kind of, I'm here, and one of the reasons why I think this conversation is, is important is I think we're at a fundamental transition in our theory and practice of governance. And our theory of governance in a way I would argue has been largely constructed through a theory which has been laid down by kings and queens, a theory of control. Um, and, you know, we today sometimes replace our kings and queens, they're called prime ministers every five years, but the theory of control is still a theory of control. And I think we're starting to reach the limit of that theory of control, which manifests in pretty much everything that we have. So even I would argue the right property ownership is a theory of control of understanding things through a single dimensional perspective. So I wanna try to put forward a series of ideas and thoughts in this conversation and hopefully the basis of further conversations as well on that, on that basis. So one thing I would like to say is that actually we are reaching, I think climate change and all these other things are, are a symptom of a failure. They're not the failure itself. They're a symptom of a world where we, in a complex emergent landscape, actually our theory of governance has fundamentally failed. And our theory of governance, as I was saying, was built out of subject-object relationships about how, uh, about the distancing of ourselves from the world, whether it's land, nature, each other, the planet, this idea of the subject-object formation fundamentally has constructed our theory of governance. And everything and all our social imaginaries, which is what say, you know, property rights are or employment contracts are, these are frameworks that reinforce that theory of subject optic relationship. And I would say, you know, whether it's Newtonian physics in terms of actually seeing things through object object interaction, or whether you look at Cartesian frameworks, these were all about constructing that. And that worldview, I think, is coming to an end and largely coming to an end because actually we are living in an age of interdependence and the feedback cycle is larger than our ability to silo and separate things. And that feedback mechanism is now self-terminating us. So that's just situating the conversation in a way. Uh, next slide, please. I'm gonna just very quickly sort of uh, put down a very 
quick architecture of, of the conversation that I want to have. Um, I'm going to give a very brief description for Dark Matter Labs, not in any way to talk about us, but just to give you a feel as to who we are. Next slide, please. So we're about 60 odd people. Next slide, please. We're 60 odd people around the world now. Uh, where uh, we have uh, we have all the way from data scientists to uh, to artists to uh, UX people to designers to policy people. So we've got a pretty diverse team right now operating around the world. Next slide, please. And we're working in many ways looking at what the transitional frameworks are but very much looking at the institutional dark matter which i would argue is kind of fundamentally rooted in our theory of governance next slide please uh, i've said this so i'm going to keep going i'm going to try to get to the meeting stuff thank you so we're working all the way from kind of uh, private city contracts in sweden but also with the european commission on looking at how to construct uh new mechanisms of organizing a, a social contract for transition, which I think is one of the biggest challenges that we face certainly in, in large-scale democratic systems is how do you organize transition in speed and time and how do you build that coherence without actually building autocratic systems? So what does that drive in that possibility? Next slide, please. Uh, all the way from permissioning me mechanisms. So we're working with Dago City to actually reimagine how you permission the city, not through a centralized idea of state, but peer to peer models of permissioning use of public realm in new formats. Next slide. Uh, to working in Canada around civic indigenous, looking at new ways of actually how we relate to land and our theory of land from not being ownership, but tre treaty orientated. Next slide. Uh, to UNDP stuff. So I'm just. I put some of these things down in terms of looking at uh, governing in an age of emergence, which is of some work we've done with UNDP, just to give you some idea of the type of work that we're doing. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. And I'm going to get to the meat of the conversation. So I, in a way, I think that's important for you to hear to say largely because I want, I want to communicate that there is an appetite for this conversation in the real world. So this isn't a kind of theoretical conversation held in closed doors in kind of in academic silos, but actually there is a conversation going on out in the real world, which I think is both challenging and interesting. So next slide, please. And in an age of complexity and emergence, one of the things that we've done is we've sort of talked about governments through what is typically called the AAA, AAA governance model, which is we still keep ideas of centralized models of control and governance, but we make the centralized models more anticipatory, more agile, and more adaptive. So this is fundamentally trying to deal with centralization and complexity through making things of governance mechanisms, whether it's policy structure, whether it's policy or whether it's other form of permission systems, more anticipatory, agile in governance. This is whilst preserving centralized systems. Next slide, please. But actually, if you look at the real challenge is much deeper than that, much, much more structural than that. Next slide, please. In kind of increasing complexity, next slide. What becomes critical is that value formation is increasingly situationalizing, personalizing, and contextualizing. So a lot of our a lot of the work, value construction is no longer is universal. And theories of universal value are being fundamentally challenged by this hyper particularity. And our governance models are increasingly challenged by that. Next slide, please. And that also means that actually fundamentally, as we move from a commodities-based economy of, i.e. preconceived value, which is being distributed to innovation-based economies where value is being created and the unknown, i.e. risk is a fundamental characteristic of the economy itself, i.e. every interaction, as opposed to commodity, which is based on certainty. You fundamentally start to have to engineer a new theory of governance because the nature of society of value formation is largely in that story. The commodity-based economy is near zero. It's near zero in terms of transaction costs. We're going to see it becoming more and more efficient. Actually, the, it's marginal value added, whereas actually the additionality is going to be on the other side. And that requires a fundamental transition in how cities and places govern themselves because you can't predict the problem and you can't predict and control any of the stuff. Next slide, please. And a lot of this stuff comes down manifest in every format. So even if you look at systems change work or any of the work that we're starting to see, what you start to see is this still preconceived by the idea that there's a select group of people that are looking down at either the system and actually being able to vector control what that contract and what that relationship needs to be. 
And that becomes increasingly challenging in many formats. And this, this applies to whether it's public, government, board of directors, any of these formats, this idea of vector control and our financial mechanisms are entirely based on this model our contract mechanisms are all based on this model the idea of actually doing linear predictions um, and object-oriented predictions there are predictions that you can do at a system scale which have a fundamentally different characteristic to linear linear prediction models next slide please and this model is manifesting whether it's in human to human relationships things or actually even the relationship between things and this control model I think is fundamentally challenged. Next slide, please. And like I sort of said, there's an acknowledgement of the problem. So in a control centralized control model, you have to acknowledge the problem, define new rules and drive compliance. Now that process typically takes four to six, maybe, well, at least 18 to 24 months if, you, if you're living in, if you're operating in a democratic system. So most of our democratic governance models are largely based on linear models of governance, linear models of prediction, linear models of waterfall governance, and are only suitable really for what I would say is uh, 18 to 24 month governance cycles. They're not suitable for real-time responses and are not suitable for long-term responses, which is actually a fundamental failure in most of our most of our governance models are uh, thinking. So long-term and short, hyper, hyper reactive, both these systems are starting to fail. Next, next slide, please. So when we start to look at that, it, it, I think we're facing this fundamental challenge. So in terms of responding to everyday complex interdependency and responding to pattern, uh, understanding pattern and responding rapidly in a different format. Next slide, please. So how do we move through this theory of governance? How do we through, move through different models? And this is parliaments around the world, and you'll see this, uh, why that's important. And it's you know, just really interesting to see how our theory of organizing has been either based, based on uh, adversarial debate or has been based on actually um, uh, centralized uh, discussions in, in some formats, but it's worth, worth us leaving. Next slide, please. So here's where it starts to get interesting. What I want to propose is a new role of governance and a new theory of governance. Next slide. And, and next slide. What that throws up is an alternative to control systems to learning systems. And I think one of the big challenges that we face is that when you can't just preconceive what is right or wrong from a centralized perspective, you have to actually incentivize and build the frameworks for learning for agents on the ground and this goes from a learning a control oriented system to learning systems and that i think is a fundamental shift in our theory of governance so what is a learning parliament what is a learning constitution what is learning regulation what is learning um uh, what is a learning political party these are all fundamentally a different modality. What is even learning politics when it isn't actually trying to predict and control what the future tells us? This is a different form of relationship between each other and ourselves in different formats. Next slide, please. And that also requires us to actually expand our theory of personhood and the idea of who is the learner, who is the person learning. And I think this, this is where it starts to get interesting. Not only do we move from control oriented systems, do we also move to, to learner, learner oriented systems, which I think is allows for decentralization of agency in a way that it's never been done before. Next slide, please. So how do we move from governing things in a kind of linear sense to, to governing parameters of things? Um, so regulate the parameters, which is I think where we're headed as an intermediary model which is using parametric governance models to actually governing in between things, which is actually governing the learning capabilities of systems and the curricular frameworks of systems, as opposed to trying to even to do it centrally. So I think there's a kind of three phase transition to this, to this model. Next slide, please. And in, in a kind of, in a learning oriented model, what you have to do is the quality of input, the integrity of feedback and the quality of implementation. So what you're looking at is actually a fundamentally different model. You're not regulating the outcome or the output. What you're regulating is actually how the system is, is, is being a learning agent. And that changes, I think, some of the structural relationships in these processes. Next model, please. And that operates at an individual level. It operates at a landscape level and can operate at an ecosystem level. And I think these, these things will need to be nested systems and different formats. Next model. And what this starts to take us is an idea where actually what you don't have is centralized control, 
but what you have is interrelationship between things. And what you end up with a model is that, that a car becomes a learning agent, is not centrally controlled or governed, but what you're governing is the learning capacity of that car or a building or a surveillance camera or other things or even urban forests. So you start to actually have a different theory of how we engage and operate in that world. Next slide, please. So as we start to see that, I think this fundamentally changes our theory of, of, the, of the object. And I think this is where it gets interesting for us as architects and designers, because I think the nature of the object fundamentally goes from being the object to subject relationship, but a new theory of how we place ourselves in that world. Next slide, please. So within that autonomous learning system, what is the nature of that object? Next slide. Now we're seeing, you know, you'll all know about this stuff in terms of actually some of the kind of capabilities that are being built. Um, in terms of decision making capabilities. So what happens when you start to have advanced decision making capabilities, advanced learning capabilities at the object level? How does that change that idea of personhood? Next slide, please. And legal personhood, and many of you will know this, is a theory of rights and responsibilities. It's your ability to negotiate rights and responsibilities simultaneously. And we've seen the expansion of legal personhood being constructed around the world as we start to realize that single point optimization doesn't work for, uh, for complex objects. So a, 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 an urban forest has a multiplicity of outcomes, but ownership reduces it to the value of timber. But if you actually start to conceive it as legal personhood, you start to see the co-beneficial outcomes of many of these systems and how do you evolve them. Next slide, please. And we've seen examples, whether it's the, the river in New Zealand or a lake in the uh, in United States or in Ecuador, constitutional rights of nature or, uh, or other places around the world. So we're starting to see this idea of legal person. And I think even a, there's a kind of court case been going, going on for a while around chimpanzees getting legal rights. We know that hippos have got legal personhood in, uh, I, I, th I think, um, uh, in, in South America, uh, South America. So what you're starting to see is this extension and theory of legal personhood as a mechanism to recognize the embodied capability, the embodied intelligence, and the embodied co-beneficiary effects of things themselves. Next slide, please. And you can take that also at, even at the level of a building. So a building, for example, has its its value is its land value, its asset, its rental value, but it also has impact on. Uh, waste uh, waste system. It also has an impact on energy systems. It also has impact on health outcomes. It also has impact on carbon embodied carbon waste. It has, also has all these secondary economies that are maintenance economies, all the way through to job creation. If you multiply it and the aggregate effects of building, you start to realize that our objects are entangled systems. And if you recognize that entangled system, you have to start to reorganize our theory of uh, of of operation and value organization in new formats. Next slide, please. So with that em embodied capability and the entangled capability, how do we start to start to think about a new theory of governance? And these operate all the way, you know, like I was saying, where it's embodied, embodied carbon, embodied value, spillover values, intangible assets, and, and, uh, intangible values of these things. So these operate at multiple different formats. Next slide, please. So the kind of proposition I want to put forward today is that single point optimization of governance, i.e. through ownership and control models, actually destroy complex value situations. They, they misunderstand and destroy the complex value and liability relationships of things and environments around us. And they do not work for a complex entangled world. So what we need to do is uh, transform our theory of actually governance at a, from a single point optimization to a co-beneficiary recognition of objects. And that entangled reality of objects actually changes our theory of governance. Next slide. And this is where actually synthetic personhood becomes really important as a mechanism to start to deal with some of this stuff. And, and synthetic personhood actually, especially if, it's a, if we can start to build some form of programmatic agency around this, which I think is critical, to uh, look at the, co the balancing and the consensus of co-beneficiary effects in new formats, it becomes critical. Next slide, please. And these things become actually codependent systems between the learning models at a meta-governance level to actually the learning agents at the object level. Next slide, please. 
So in a complex world, this kind of capabilities of complexity, autonomous learning and legal personhood, I think are going to be fundamental capabilities of a new governance theory in terms of actually building, recognizing this kind of relationship that we are in treaty with the world. And every object is build, building complex emergent relationships. Next slide, please. Again, next slide, please. So if we sort of, this has all been theory, if we then sort of start to say, okay, what, how does this manifest in, the, in, this, in this future? So next slide. How does this manifest if a uh, forest governs itself? Again, everything I'm showing here is experiments that we're either in the middle of or just starting as well. So how does a forest govern itself? And what are the frameworks of that? And what are the kind of autonomous capabilities of putting humans in the loop of that moment? And sort of new interdependent realities. Next slide, please. How does a building govern itself? So a self-sovereign free house, we're building something called a free house where a house owns itself. How do you construct that new reality of a building that owns itself? Next slide. How does a car govern itself if it's not owned, but is actually an autonomous learning agent? Next slide, please. To even a surveillance camera. And I think surveillance cameras are really interesting examples because when you make them autonomous learning agents, they don't become monolithic mechanisms of power at the center, but they do allow for them, them to be manifested with visual learning capabilities to actually be able to autonomously um, respond to requests for, uh, respond to things they see, but also re respond to actual legal, legal requests to share information. But they become a network of autonomous agents, which I think deals with some of those big surveillance challenges that we're trying to deal with. So I think this governance mechanism opens up some of these capabilities. Next slide, please. So I suppose I want to, this is where I, I want to sort of come in and maybe we can open up some of the discussions. I think this is a sort of question that I think it, for me and a lot of the work at DM is starting to become really clear, is that I think we're moving to being able to give embodied uh, learning capacity and governance capacity at the level of objects. And that I think changes our theory of governance and our theory of practice, but also our relationship with the world. Our relationship with the world does not be does is no longer one of control, um, is not one of ownership in the classic format, but it's about being in relationship with the world, being in treaty with the world, being in treaty with things, looking at multi beneficiary effects. I think whilst this feels like a technical revolution, I think at the other end of this is actually a different type of revolution of how we relate to the world fundamentally, and this is where you know I would say the biggest challenge that we face is that the recognition of our shift in our relationship with the world. So us as humans are a multitude of organization, organisms, multitude of organisms. We know our brain is a function of our social contract with everyone else around us, right? It's, a, it's not linked in our mind, actually, it's a social relationship. We know actually epigenetically, we're fundamentally triggered by our physical context. We know that in terms of microbiomes, they have massive effect on us as human beings. So we are an interdependent organism. And yet we think about ourselves through the idea of individuals, discrete individuals. And this idea of interdependence nests itself everywhere. So if we're going to be agents in a world, and I think we're going to increase agency, autonomous agency in the world, and recognize autonomous agency in the world, I think we have to transform our theory of governance fundamentally to a new relationship. And that requires a reflection of ourselves, but also and a transformation of ourselves, which is, I think, the cultural product. But I think it's a fundamentally a new transformation about the things around us and then also how we relate with things around us. And by relate, I also mean at the level of touch, at the level of actually our human experience with things around us when they're no longer things of waste, object, subject oriented um, ownership models. There's a new relationship of care that I think becomes fundamental. Next slide, please. And with that, I will close here. I think I should be on time. Thank you. Uh, indeed, thank you so much. Uh, uh, I don't know if you can see me or, or hear me, but uh, I can. You know, thank you so much for this, uh, again, this setup. I think this is a really uh, fascinating way of starting this conversation. Uh, in, a, in a way, I guess I have 
a couple of questions. And I also would uh, remind uh, our audience uh, to uh, please uh, share your questions in the broadcasting chat, which uh, we will pass along. But maybe just to kick off the conversation. Of course. Um, I think there's uh, something really provocative, maybe even more provocative than it seems at first sight in what you're proposing, uh, which is basically, it's, it's not just about, I guess, within your this framework, uh, the conversation isn't just about who does the governing, who does the governance, but actually what governance is. It's, uh, that's, uh, the setup of this implies that as we move away from control systems to, to, to learning systems, as you put it, this implies that the governance is not only embedded in the, you know, what we call it, what we might call like the, the avatars of decision-making, the kind of the politicians, yeah. right? But in, in the infrastructures themselves uh, in which these decisions are embedded, right? Uh, there, it's kind of a shift towards what governance is, which would imply that if governance is locked into, is, is baked into infrastructure and the city is a type of infrastructure or, or let's say a technology that, that creates uh, these infrastructures, it means that we need to have both more reactive systems, but also to kind of acknowledge the lock-in effects of these infrastructures on which we depend, right? Uh, if it's the systems that do part of the governing because they allow for things to happen, uh, that also implies that it, it's not just about cities and about urban infrastructures, but also about ecological infrastructures that dictate these, these rules that actually are part of what governance is. Very so, much agree. Uh, and again, this, this I think is, uh, it may seem very sort of philosophical, but I think it actually has quite deep effects on what we might think of politics. So I guess I have two questions. Uh, the, the first one being, uh, are, are we actually pragmatically, socially ready to, to, to embrace this implication that agency lives away from these avatars, away from these kind of individuals, precisely at a time where we want more accountability from politicians? <laughs> like that, that's one very pragmatic problem, I would say. And the second one is, okay, if that's the case, how do we deal with the lock-in effects uh, that are given to us? Because uh, these systems that are available to us, these infrastructures are, are put in place and aren't as, let's say, dynamic as, as, uh, as we would like them to be, uh, especially in the case of the city where we can't really change uh, as quickly as we would like to, uh, you know, city grids and things like this. And especially in the case of ecological infrastructure, uh, which operates uh, along, you know, the, the carbon cycle, the, the oxygen cycle, and so on, uh, operate around their own rules. So I'm sorry if this is a lot to to process, no. but uh, this has been really kind of the the main thing uh, on my mind as you were as you were describing this new theory of governance. No, I look. I so firstly, I totally agree with you. I think this is a subtle but structural shift. Um, I would put it slightly differently. I think one of the big problems that we face is we're already living in some of this world where actually we keep blaming politicians for things that actually they can't control and they no longer have the influence over and secondly i would argue that that we're asking them to make predictions and and so we're judging them on their ability to say i will do this in a complex emergent world in, and it's probably the most complex emergent world Whereas actually what we should be talking about is the ability to enhance the learning capacity of the system to make it more better in more inclusive, more private. So I think this is, this is a fundamentally political question. So it's not the classic form of leadership, which is goal-oriented leadership or output-oriented leadership. I think we look for a different theory of politics in this and a different theory of the relationship and power of meta-governance frameworks, which I think are going to be about coding and recoding the learning capacity of systems and making them more advanced. So governance becomes fundamentally something else. You're right. So it's a bit like a school, right? It, it, so it, uh, the curriculum of children is governed by the state in a way. So it is the curriculum structure of a governance system that becomes more and more critical. And that's where the integrity of politics starts to lie, as opposed to actually in trying to make decisions in a complex emerging world. So it decentralized decision-making, but it actually really starts to build the capacity of learning into those models. So that's, that's, that, that would be my one way. The second thing is I think whether we're ready or not, if we're trying to, let's not, demo, the word democracy has become far too contagious in a way. But if we talk about building a world where distributed decentralized agency is being maximized, right? So we wanna build, and that is a response to both complexity, but also, theories of object freedoms and uh, agency effects, right? It becomes very clear 
And then you marry that with a world of innovation, which is kind of, I think, where value is being created. Actually, we have to deal with this governance issue. So this, this is no longer a choice. I think it's a fundamental paradigm breakdown. And I think this is why I keep, why I said right at the beginning, for me, we're living at the edge of a paradigm, a sort of a, a, a multi-thousand year paradigm of, of what I call kings and queens and centralized systems actually having to break down to deal with new forms of agency. And yes, I think there'll be a new theory of kings and queens, which will be, I think, perhaps learning models and this learning frameworks. But I think it will massively increase the scope and scale of, uh, of agency on the other side of the system. And that's a necessity to deal with, I think, climate change in the world that we're facing. And the final point I'd say is, thank you for, I do believe it's revolutionary because I think, I think it's revolutionary, the language is really straightforward, but the revolutionary part is I think it fundamentally changes our relationship with ourselves and our relationship with the world. And that to me is something really powerful because I think that our relationship with the world has become both distanced, abstracted, and actually in that process uh, allows us to con commit violence. So our theory of object-subject relationships construct the framework for violence in that framework. So I think this is actually about a more structural shift at the center of that uh, in that modality. Mm. Uh, I have a couple of questions from, from the, the audience here as well. Uh, one of them would be, don't you think that a big role will be played not by agents, but by uh, territorial cooperatives? Or in other words, the way that I would also maybe add to this is what are the kind of institutions uh, if we are thinking about the agents uh, and not to make it into a, like another type of subject, another type of human centric construct, but actually think of them in terms of landscapes and cooperatives and, and institutions. Uh, what could be the, the blueprints for these? So I, I think there are sort of, I mean, so we're doing some work around sort of semi-autonomous uh, institutions which actually build some of those learning frameworks and build some of those aggregative knowledge, which exists out the, outside the subject relationship of the car itself. So this is a nested fractal framework. So yes, there will be definitely other, other agents in the system. This is why I think it's, it's slightly, I don't want to build it as a vertical stack because I think it misunderstands the problem. Um, but I think that let's, if you put it around the object, yes, they are other landscape level things. The one thing I will add there is I think this is something we haven't reconciled, but I think landscape level organization, I think is going to become really interesting because there's forms of value that can only be constructed at the aggregative level. So there is something that happens at the aggregative level, but I think it'll, it will be much more an aggregative form rather than uh, a monolithic form of, of the aggregative value. So I think definitely there's aggregative uh, forms of, of governance that all come in at the landscape and operational level. Mm -hmm. This actually also makes me think that along with this kind of shift of what governance is, it may also lead to a shift away from, again, the autonomous as, as even the, as, as the right word. Uh, as you mentioned also in the case of autonomous cars, it'd be more relevant to think of them as hyper-dependent cars, which are relevant, dependent on context, dependent on data sets, depending on all the drivers that were, you know, their input was put into the, the labor of the vehicle. And perhaps again, this subtle shift away from the language that we even use to, to, to define these things. I think that's absolutely right. And you, I think you're, you're spot on on this. I think the idea of autonomy is, is falsified in that. I think we have to more and more talk about agency in an entangled world. And it's how the construction of, I think you can talk about sort of programmable agency, um, which I think is some aspect of that in an entangled system. So I think there's a theory of agency that needs to be constructed and understood in that theory. But I think autonomy might be still a fallback to an old world, world view of trying to see us as kind of singular objects. Mm. Uh, I hope I can ask maybe one last question. Uh, uh, sure. We need to move uh, to the next speaker, but I'm just also wondering, uh, the interesting thing about your practice is also that you're not simply presenting projects, but you're also presenting, uh, or you're designing a field of practice. You're designing essentially a, a type of work that is important to be done. And I'm just wondering if you have any, any tips or any, any types of uh, lessons that you feel cities should be implementing in order to set up more institutions such as yours in order to help deal with these challenges. I, 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 firstly, I just want to acknowledge, I think there's many, many other brilliant people doing this sort of work as well. So I just, uh, you know, I think Prima de Vera, who was following us, has done brilliant work on some of this stuff. And I think it's, um, I, th I remember meeting her at, uh, in Paris and I thought it was just extraordinary work. So I think there's many, many people doing this sort of work and we all stand on each other's shoulders. Certainly I do anyway. Um, I think for me, what I find 
challenging right now is that um, what's happening right now is everyone's trying to focus on the problem and then the direct solution. And actually, I what I'm really trying to say is, and I think this is a real fundamental challenge, is that we're sort of more and more focused on carbon technologies. And that's where money allocation is. Actually, the amount of innovation and investment going into governance innovation, which I think is actually the paradigm shift we're in the middle of, or innovate, is very, very small. So one of the key things, I think, is reimagining our theory of how we relate to the world and the structural work that's required in it, the cultural work. This is also cultural work, right? It's not even just, it's, it's about how we reimagine ourselves. And the cultural work is so critical to make this revolution happen in a structural sense. So I think there is requirement at that level. I think governments are starting to understand it from a really boring sense. So you know that, that drawing I showed about the house. Um, so if you, Europe has to retrofit all of its, all pretty much every house in Europe, right? To retrofit every house in Europe, the energy savings are only about 35% of the value. So the rest of the value has to be constructed either out of health, social care value, or in uh, health, social care, or education, so the effects. Right? Then the rest of the value has to be constructed around almost the currency level effects of renovating the, all those houses, which means you actually, the velocity of currency that you introduce creates value at the whole society level. So when you start to look at these entangled business models that start to emerge, they all end up heading this way. So that's why we're doing a lot of work on the financial modeling side, because that's the way I think most of our current crisis can't be solved at the, at the autonomous individual level. It has to be solved at the entanglement value level. And this stuff I'm talking about isn't just a Western or a non-Western thing. We're talking about this in UAE and Dubai and other places where people start to understand this idea of entangled value formation. So I think the financial model and the business model is a really interesting way for cities to start to enter this point of conversation. And then you go further. Sorry, uh, uh, Nicholas, if I answered too long, but just to give practical pathways of okay. No, uh, thank you so much, Andy. This was really a pleasure. I wish we could go on for longer because it is a much longer conversation uh, that we need to move on to our next speaker. But thank you very much for joining us today. My pleasure, friends. Uh, it's now my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, uh, Primavera de Filippi. So Primavera is a, a research director at the National Center of Scientific Research in Paris and faculty associate at the Burkham Klein Center for Internet and Society at Harvard. Uh, her research focuses on the legal challenges and opportunities of blockchain technology and artificial intelligence with a specific focus on governance and trust. She's the co-author of the book, Blockchain and the Law, uh, published by Harvard University Press, and was recently awarded a grant from the European Research Council to investigate uh, how blockchain technologies can help improve uh, institutional governance through uh, greater confidence and trust. So Primavera, thank you so much uh, for joining us and, and welcome. Thank you. Um, yeah, uh, so let me share the screen. Yeah, so um, uh, yeah, today I want to speak about uh, blockchain technology and how it actually um, can participate to a uh, new me mechanism of governance, uh, both at the institution level and uh, at the community level. And then I will conclude with some examples of how uh, blockchain technology are, or some attempt at uh, um, using blockchain technology at the level of like uh, city cities and city governments. Um, so just to, to start with a little introduction, um, essentially we have been witnessing uh, quite some um, substantial erosion of trust, uh, but in the financial system, um, most particularly with, uh, with the financial crisis of 2008, which has uh, somehow shown that uh, financial institutions uh, are not as trustworthy as uh, it could have been felt of. Um, but this also has been um, followed up by a decline of public trust, uh, but in terms of uh, uh, governments with like a constant decline um, in trust in, uh, in governmental authorities, but also like uh, when we look on like internet operators and so forth, we can see that uh, as more and more of our interaction are actually happening online, yet we actually distrust uh, the operators that are managing those, um, those, uh, those, those interactions. And, uh, and so blockchain technology has been somehow proposed as a particular solution against this uh, uh, lack 
of trust or this erosion of the trust. Um, and the solution that is proposed is this trustless technology. And so because we don't have trust in institution anymore, then we, we, we devise a technology that will eliminate the need for trust and will enable us to interact without those, um, those institution. Um, and so the, the, the particularity of the blockchain, I'm just gonna go very fast, uh, is of course it's a decentralized database, it's global and transnational, um, resilient in the sense that it's really, really difficult to shut it down because everyone holds uh, the full copy, every node on the network holds a full copy of the blockchain. It's tamper resistant in the sense that uh, uh, once information has been added into the blockchain, it's uh, uh, almost impossible to modify it or to delete it. Uh, transparent because it actually provides this traceability because every node in the network needs to validate the transactions. Uh, non repudiable uh, because every transaction that has been recorded on the blockchain has been recorded with the private key, uh, with, the, with the signature of the actor that is actually recording it. And so uh, one cannot deny uh, having done a transaction that has been recorded or one cannot pretend not having done a transaction if it is um, visible on the blockchain. And um, most of those blockchain are also pseudonymous in the sense that anyone can actually join the network just by um, creating a public-private keeper. And then most interestingly, perhaps uh, with the, the more sophisticated, the more modern version of blockchain, uh, which implement the possibility of deploying software directly on the blockchain, and therefore uh, to create uh, um, applications which come with a guarantee of execution, meaning that there is no single operator that can uh, either terminate the execution of this software or modify and influence uh, its uh, operation. And so what happened is that um, if we look at the, at the history of blockchain technology, we can see that there is three big waves of adoption. Uh, initially, we have the crypto libertarians or like the pioneers, which were interested really in this ideology of this intermediation and decentralization. And then it has been slowly uh, adopted also by industrial player, corporate actor, which actually saw an opportunity for profits with this technology. And uh, more recently, there is also public and private institutions uh, which are looking at the benefits of the technology, not because of the disintermediation, not because of the profit potential, but actually in order to try and restore public trust. And this is the one uh, that I want to focus on um, right now. Uh, so I'm gonna. Uh, directly go there. So basically what happened is that because of those uh, characteristics that are provided by blockchain technology, um, it is possible to obtain specific technological guarantees, uh, which can provide both um, benefits in terms of transparency, um, in the sense that everyone can see uh, what are the transactions that have been made, and uh, everyone can have a guarantee that once a particular condition is met, then a transaction will be automatically executed by the network. And so this is really interesting for like all those kind of certifications, mechanism, uh, audits, like real time audits and traceability and, um, and so forth. And then also in terms of accountability, uh, which means that you can introduce much more predictability about what will happen when uh, without needing to trust uh, the operation and the proper management of those traditional centralized operator or trusted authority. And so what is interesting here is that uh, while we are oftentimes describing blockchain technology as a trustless technology, we actually can leverage this technology with the objective of actually rebuilding trust in institutions. And, uh, and it's interesting because um, we have like, it's, it's oftentimes uh, not, um, it's not natural to, to trust those complex systems, those institutions that we that we create, and all the time we need to create systems of check and balances and regulation and supervision and uh, separation of powers uh, in order to ensure that those trusted authority, uh, those fiduciary entities, are not actually abusing the power that we are giving them. And um, the the idea with auction is that. Uh, we should not need to trust those actors. Uh, we should actually always have the possibility to verify, uh, to verify every single action that they have done and to have like a proper proof 
uh, that things has been executed in the way in which uh, it has been claimed. And so the idea is to shift the trust from the people, from the, the people that are making the institution towards the technology, the underlying technology that is incorporated within the information system. Now, the thing is that when we think about blockchain technology as a trustless technology, it's actually only a negative definition. So we are actually defining it as what it is not. So it's a technology that doesn't need and doesn't um, doesn't rely on trust in order to operate. Uh, but uh, it's more interesting to actually think about what is the positive definition of that. And what, what the blockchain actually provides is confidence. So we have this distinction between trust, which is uh, we, we entrust someone or we entrust a particular institution, uh, which means that we put ourselves into this vulnerable, vulnerable position in which we depend on the whims uh, of this institution. And, uh, and so we're taking some kind of risk. Whereas by increasing confidence, we're actually uh, we're, we're increasing the, the degree of uh, uh, predictability that the system has. And the, the goal is, of course, not to completely eliminate trust, because actually trust can also be very valuable. And there is like trust relationship can, can actually bring a much better uh, outcome than having a completely trustless system. But the question is more like, how do we module those, uh, those technologies? How do we integrate them into existing institutions in order to increase the level of confidence and therefore instead of having to trust the institution from A to Z, uh, we increase the confidence for a particular uh, proportion by incorporating those technological guarantees. And then there is only that much of trust that is necessary. And it's easier, easier to trust that much than to trust the whole thing. Um, and so um, those, uh, this confidence, what it is generated by, it's uh, uh, like all those different properties combined of the blockchain, uh, technology, which is the, um, of course, first of all, the math and the, the underlying cryptography, uh, which make, which provide this proof and this verifiability that things cannot be tampered with. Uh, and then there is the economic, economic incentive that comes along with it uh, to ensure that um, people are actually aligned and incentivized to act in a particular manner. And so why does it matter, uh, especially like in the context of public institutions is uh, one, it actually provides this really important answer of attribution. So who has done what and when? And so it, the, the, the blockchain, by recording all the steps of a particular process, by recording all the transactions, it provides this very clear um, attribution and, uh, and like auditability and traceability of what has happened. And secondly, is in terms of deterministic computation. So we can, we can predict with a very, very high uh, degree of um, accuracy that whenever there is a particular condition, then this will lead to a particular outcome. And this doesn't depend on anyone else, but the technological infrastructure. And so as long as the governance of the underlying uh, blockchain network operates properly, then we, we, are, we are sure that uh, um, this computation will actually execute in a particular manner. And so what is interesting is that then by by creating confidence via those technological guarantees, then we can restore or we can increase the trust that we have in our existing institutions. And so uh, just a few examples maybe of uh, how um, currently uh, public institutions are actually leveraging blockchain technology in order to increase confidence and therefore restore trust. Uh, we have, of course, uh, Estonia, which is perhaps one of the landmark um, governments which have been experimenting with blockchain technology, uh, they partnered back in 2017 with BitNation uh, in order to provide notarization services uh, for like the electronic residents, so people could uh, record contract, um, record like birth certificate or like um, weddings and so forth, like everything that an, ele an electronic resident wanted to notarize, they could do that via a blockchain infrastructure. We have also a few countries which have been experimenting with land registries uh, in order to create a digital and certified backup of uh, every single transaction that will happen on the official uh, land registry. Although most of those experiments have actually not really uh, led to any actual implementation. It was mostly like proof of concept to see whether this is possible. Um, but essentially, the idea is that the adoption of blockchain technology can lead to this uh, increased transparency and, uh, and reliability 
and verifiability uh, with regard to governmental data and governmental records. Um, and then, of course, we have like all the question of uh, uh, regulatory compliance. So, but between existing public institutions, but also private institutions that are regulating institution or fiduciary entities, uh, the adoption of blockchain te technology can actually prove and can actually increase via those technological guarantees the likelihood of regulatory compliance, but in terms of auditing, uh, in terms of reporting, and uh, with the guarantee of execution via the smart contract implementations. Um, and this leads us to all this concept of regulatory technology, which is basically uh, shifting away from a system that is based on supervision, on, on like legal enforcement, uh, which happen always ex post. So entities can do what they want. They are free to, to act as they wish. And then if they do something wrong, that someone needs to identify uh, the defection and then go and enforce um, the law against. Whereas with us, by incorporating blockchain technology directly into the information system, then enforcement happens ex ante. And so there is sim simply no possibility for a breach uh, to happen in the first place, assuming that the smart contract has been properly implemented. Um, and so, yeah, basically, this, uh, this resolves the issue of regulatory compliance, the, the, the check and balances that usually require a lot of formalities and a lot of cost in terms of oversight and supervision can be flattened by just incorporating all those regulatory requirements directly into the technological framework. Um, so we have example mostly like in a financial institution where uh, uh, various technological uh, um, guarantees have been implemented in order to achieve similar uh, regulatory objectives that require usually a lot, a lot of and expensive formalities, which can be implemented very simply and much cheaper uh, via technological means. And then we have, of course, uh, in the supply chain, um, there is a lot of experimentation which are being done in order to provide this traceability, uh, proving the provenance of uh, specific goods and services, um, acting against the counterfeit counterfeiting of, uh, of product and so forth. Um, and so this is like for the, um, for the institutional governance. And then I also want to spend uh, a few minutes discussing uh, more like the governance at the at the community level as well. Um, so one is like increasing confidence. So creating those technological guarantees which are enshrined within the um, within the um, technological system. But there is also an, a second layer which is more like the governance layer. So how can we actually use blockchain technology to facilitate new mechanisms of governance which are more distributed, uh, decentralized, and potentially more participative. Um, and this is basically mostly it's a continuation of something that we have already seen on the internet, which is like all those collaborative open source uh, decentralized organization uh, that are constructed mostly around open source and things like this, but but slowly has, have also been adopted in other in other settings, Wikipedia being the most uh, uh, common example, but also um, we have seen how this this uh, this uh, this collaborative organization, which emerged in a common based approach, uh, mostly like in those open content and open source communities, uh, the model has also been taken by more private companies. Uh, so we all uh, have seen like the, the sharing economy turning into uh, basically Uber and Airbnb um, taking, can, taking over in a, in a much more corporate manner, uh, or also like most of the online platform in which people are contributing value to the network, but actually the, the value is extracted by the, um, by the, by the entity that, that, the, that by the online operator. And, um, and so the, the, this kind of uh, crowdsourcing system is actually very interesting because it relies on the contribution of the crowd, uh, but essentially it is, it, is, it is not really decentralized governance because the governance and the management and the coordination of all the contribution happens in a centralized manner. Um, and so with, with blockchain technology, we have this new, um, this new wave of, uh, uh, experimenting with new models of crowdsourced organization, but instead of having one centralized operator that is controlling all the, uh, all the contribution and that is managing them, uh, we have a much more distributed approach to the governance and to the coordination. And so this, this enters into the uh, larger movement of platform cooperativism in which the platform is not owned by one single large corporation, but is actually co-owned and co-administered by uh, the multiplicity of actors that engage with this platform. 
and um, yeah, we have uh, we have a few examples uh, in in various uh, fields of like uh, trying to replicate or simulate the functions that are currently done by uh, existing online operators, but in a more decentralized manner, whether that is um, in terms of uh, decentralized marketplaces, so try to create some, some things like Amazon or eBay, but in a fully decentralized uh, system with a blockchain technology and smart contract. We have social networks, we have like uh, Facebook without Facebook, Twitter without Twitter and so forth. Um, and again, the, the, the interesting thing is like all those systems, of course, in order to manage the governance, uh, they, also, they always rely on this notion of tokenization. And so instead of having one entity that is collecting all the, all the contribution and um, operating them, uh, when people are contributing to those collaborative organizations, they obtain tokens in return, and those tokens become the governance system by which they can engage. So this is really interesting because that means that, of course, the more one is contributing, the more they have influence, the more they have a say into the governance of the organization. But at the same time, it also means that it becomes a very uh, market-based and transactional system in which, of course, I can, I can contribute, but then I, I can transfer those tokens on the secondary market. Uh, and so those tokens have of course, not, they are not always in the hand of the ones that are contributed, uh, but they can be in the hand of people that are just collecting them for speculative purposes. Um, and um, the, 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 the interesting thing, too, is that uh, most of the time, the reason that uh, many of those common-based uh, approaches uh, fail is because there is this notion of the tragedy of the commons, which is um, there is either too much uh, exploitation of a particular resources because uh, people are free riding on it and they, they are internalizing the, the private gain, but they are not internalizing the, the, the collective uh, loss of, of uh, using the resources, or there is actually the problem of not enough incentives to contribute and therefore depletion or, or, or lack of, um, lack of uh, development of a particular uh, um, resource or organization. And here it's interesting because a blockchain-based system actually can solve this problem. It can solve the free riding problem by actually not providing those, uh, those tokens as a, as a reward to the people that did not contribute. And it can also solve the problem of congestion by requiring that people that use the platform or use the resources actually pay with those tokens. Right, and so it um, it solves the tragedy of the commons, but at, of course at the cost of reintroducing this transactionality in spaces in which usually we don't rely on market mechanisms. So this is a trade-off uh, that of course requires a particular uh, thinking about what is the right governance structure to implement in order to achieve those benefits and in order to create proper incentive systems while uh, without distorting or uh, without harming the actual dynamics that pre-existed within those organizations. Um, we created a those uh, uh, decentralized uh, organizations which are created by the community. Yes. Our speaker is freeze. So. I'm back here. Uh, yes, Primer, I think you you froze just for for a second. Yeah, yeah, no worry. So I'm just going to conclude. Anyway, I just wanted to give a few examples uh, of uh, how blockchain technology is uh, being. Uh, I mean, it's not really being used yet, but there's like all those envisioning of how we can use blockchain technology in the context of cities uh, of yeah, sovereign spaces. Um, and so we have uh, starting with like uh, Puerto Rico. So the the, the crypto utopia uh, of Seoul, um, where the idea is that uh, there is like a few crypto uh, millionaires or billionaires um, that uh, following the, 
the devastation in Puerto Rico have uh, coordinated in order to purchase uh, a lot of land and uh, with the goal of actually incorporating a new city, uh, which apparently will be uh, governed mostly by, uh, you know, with, with, the, with, the, with cryptocurrency and governed by smart contracts and uh, like all the, um, all the government uh, uh, service will actually be done via notarization, via, via like everything recorded on a smart contract. Um, and of course, the, the idea is, is quite interesting in terms of experimentation, but it of course comes with an extremely strong crypto libertarian flavor in which the, the idea of in, introducing this blockchain technology is more a way of actually uh, escaping or protecting away from existing uh, governmental regulation and creating this new system, uh, which is extremely experimental and uh, innovative, but also extremely transactional and market-based. Uh, we also have blockchain LLC, which is also, uh, so again, uh, some crypto millionaire that purchased land uh, in Nevada, and uh, they, they want to create this innovation zone, which is specifically uh, specifically provided by the state of Nevada in order to allow for uh, uh, some type of innovation at the governance level. And again, here the idea is to have a blockchain mediated uh, governance structure for that, um, for that city and uh, creating a smart city that is fully, completely um, run via uh, smart contracts and, uh, and basically trying to eliminate uh, a maximum of governmental authority or municipal authority in this context. Um, and then finally, we have this example uh, in Senegal. Um, oops, uh, yeah, we have like Akon City. And uh, here the idea is even to create a new cryptocurrency and that every single transaction that will be made uh, in that city will be done via this cryptocurrency and most of the governmental service will be mediated by smart contract and so forth. And so those are all uh, quite, I mean, really interesting in terms of, um, of innovation and also very uh, problematic when we actually see who are actually running those projects and what are the intentions why they are running those projects. And oftentimes it's not really about creating more collective and participatory governance, but it's actually about uh, creating a hyper uh, hyper libertarian uh, system in which like uh, we eliminate the taxes to the maximum and everything is like done on a micro payments for every single services that are required. Um, and so just to conclude on this note, um, I think it's important when we're thinking about uh, using blockchain technology for governance, we need to, we need to reflect about uh, this distinction between decentralized infrastructure uh, and blockchain technology is a decentralized infrastructure, but it's not enough to have a decentralized infrastructure in order to also ensure uh, distributed governance, right? And so if we actually want to promote more decentralization of the governance level, it's not enough to start with a level playing field and just hope that things will just stay uh, in a decentralized manner because there are always those uh, oligopolistic tendencies and uh, especially when everything is based on token-based and uh, plutocratic model, uh, it, it, it happens oftentimes that while the technology is decentralized, um, because there is no institution that is actually protecting it and that is actually protecting the decentralization, just like we have seen with the market, then oftentimes it's actually power concentrate um, and it concentrates into like invisible cluster. And because there is no governmental authority, bureaucracy, and all those check and balances, which are actually designed to avoid uh, this type of uh, uh, oligopolies of power, uh, then if we look today at most of the blockchain implementation, they are oftentimes actually very, very centralized in, the, in, their, uh, in their governance structure. And so just to conclude, um, we do have a new technology which actually have a uh, huge potential, uh, especially to introduce uh, more transparency and accountability with an existing institution. Uh, the problem is that the way in which it is oftentimes being used is, is by alternative and new economic player, which are trying to uh, bypass existing institution uh, in order to eventually replicate pretty much the same economic or political order as before. Um, and so just as a, as a as last sentence, I will say like, um, with this talk, I'm not at all trying to dissuade 
uh, people or institution in exploring blockchain technology, but I think it's actually more and more important to explain uh, to governmental authority, to municipality, what are the benefits of this technology and that they adopt it uh, in order to restore the trust that, uh, that they need to the public trust uh, in those institutions. Um, so that actually we don't see those kind of private cities emerging, uh, trying to position themselves as alternative and as more trustless uh, institution instead of actually trying to rebuild trust and require uh, these, um, this, this, this relationship of trust between citizens and uh, municipalities. Um, yeah, I will stop here. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Primavera. Uh, as, I, as I understand that you, you had a, a hard stop and unfortunately we, we won't have time to, to go into the, the questions, uh, but I wanna thank you for, for, for sharing the, the presentation and thank everyone for, for joining us. Uh, apologies, our session ran a little bit out over time because of the interesting uh, topic. So please join us for our next uh, session, which is starting uh, in a few minutes. Uh, which will be on a topic of uh, crowdsourcing platforms, the place of uh, people in urban change. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining us.